All right, question number one. Uh, we'll now go to Mr. Edelson. And apparently it is resonating with everybody because we have about six questions on a similar topic. What is your opinion on the proposed construction of 400 plus apartments on land that was purchased for um, commercial usage or whatever? Not being from here, I'm not familiar with the issues, but that means that I'm framing the question as impartially as possible. 90 seconds, Mr. Edelson. We're still having a little trouble with the sound. I see that. How about, is mine any? No, mine's not any better. Yeah, there you go. Keep going. Keep the, yeah, keep Bill's off and you can talk. Maybe. So? Maybe. <laughs> Well, let me, let me just say a few things about the corporate park, and I hope you... Well, maybe now you can hear me. Can, is this working? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, I think a lot of us were just shocked last week by the corporate park uh, strategy session, or so-called strategy session. And it really, it was not a strategy session. It was a chance for one developer to come forward and show an idea that they had. Uh, I think this town had been extremely clear. I can't... I've lived in 14 different towns. I've never seen a town that has been clearer about what it wants for a piece of property like that. And it is, the record is filled with uh, references, including many of them by Bill, saying that what we wanted to do with those 200 acres was build a corporate park. And I want to clarify that. It did not say a commercial park. You go through all the planning records, it doesn't say commercial. Corporate, what's the difference? We had in mind, just about every one of us who signed or uh, voted, was something like IBM. Some of us even use the term IBM II or Apple East. Well, we were dreaming. But anyway, that's what we wanted there. What we saw was very different. But regardless of the differentiation between commercial and corporate, everyone was clear it did not have residential. And it clearly did not have residential as the proponent or the first phase of that. And so that was an insult. But there were several other insults. And some of this is, uh, some of you might have heard last night. I felt it was a violation of the public trust. Again, we had been very clear with our vote several years ago why we wanted this piece of land. Couldn't have been clearer, and all of a sudden, our town leaders bring forward a proposal that's 180 degrees from what we had said we wanted. No explanation. If someone, a leader had stepped forward and said, you know, times have changed. We've been through a lot of things these last few years, and I know what you voted on a few years ago, but we've got to change. If somebody had made that argument and said, that's why this proposal is coming forward, I would have listened. I would have been open-minded to that, but nobody made any attempt to do it. We were just thrusted in there. And then finally, the public trust that I'm given as a Board of Finance member, and every one of the other board members there, we are asked to do the town's work. When a proposal like that comes forward, we have the ability to review it, ask questions. That was taken away from us. We were left with little note cards to ask questions. No room for follow-up. That's not the way to conduct a hearing. That's not the way to conduct a uh, town meeting of that nature. Who should I be looking at? You or you? Okay. Right there. I saw you I'm moving just, in on I'm me. Just in so on. I just would, in conclusion, I'm very much uh, not only against what was proposed uh, last Thursday. Okay, sir, it's, it's a minute and a half. Time up. Time's up. I didn't know if you. Okay. That was going the wrong place. Mr. Gates, would you like to use this one? Minute and a half, please. And Rhoda, just wait if you would. Yeah, but this. Can you hear me out there? Yes. yes. The Southbury Corporate Park was, uh, the developers came in looking for uh, permission to, do, to develop that property about a year ago, and we had some confidential meetings with them. Uh, I had told them from the beginning that a housing component would not work on that property. We listened to what they had to say. Uh, they thought they could do it without the housing component, and then they came back with this plan. I told them no. From my 30 years of planning, I knew that this was unacceptable to the town. The two things that were unacceptable on that property is the housing component and the management of traffic. There's no way with anything that large that the traffic that it would generate could be sustained by the roads that are in Southbury. We don't need another 1,000, 1,500 cars per day coming down Main Street. The developers were told unequivocally that they would have to find some way to get those cars on and off I-84 without impacting the level of traffic in town. Uh, they didn't seem to understand, being from not from the, the city of 
Salisbury, <laughs> that, uh, that how vehemently the town would be opposed to that. So we suggested a town hearing where they could come and present their proposal and see the reaction that they would get. I think they got that reaction. I think they got the message. We are in touch with them now to get them to say publicly that they are no longer interested in any kind of... Boy, that went faster than this. <laughs> when you're having fun... I think, I think your clock is around. Um, okay, keep, Mr. Davis, keep the microphone. Can you hear me if I yes. yell the question out? Yes. Okay, to both candidates, starting with Mr. Davis. What is your vision or long-range plan for Southbury, economically, aesthetically, or whatever else you will? Okay, 90 seconds, Rhoda. I'm sure you're doing this. Southbury is a great town. It's one of the best towns in the state of Connecticut, as I stated. I've lived here all my life. I firmly believe that. I love this town. The business climate in Southbury is very good for businesses to come in. They love our demographics. We're relatively wealthy. We have uh, an elderly population that spends their money. We have uh, a middle class that lives here. Uh, there is over 400,000 square feet of buildable area left on Main Street to develop. We would like to see that developed the same way the rest of it has, in a very cohesive manner in, uh, in, in, in planning with the Main Street plan that we have in place. I see Southbury as growing. I don't see it as going wild. I don't see apartment building or anything like that in its future. I don't see multi-story office buildings. I think we have to control the growth as we have in the last 30 years and Southbury will be in fine shape. Our school system is the best, and these companies are really waiting for the economy to turn around so that they can come to Southbury. Okay, Mr. Edelson. Well, I, I think I would like to answer that question by pointing out how I began my campaign, and one of the first issue papers that I put forward was on the need for a strategic plan. But you know, that wasn't my idea, it was your idea. Back when the charter revision was done three years ago, and the process even began before that, we as a community said what this town is missing is a strategic plan. Now that's not up to Bill to say, here's my plan. It's not up to me to say, here's my plan. It's up to the community to have a process where we come together and we say, this is the, the strategic plan that we've got. What is a strategic plan? I know some people are a little you know, fuzzy on that. But the important pieces to it our early identification of the town's strengths, Bill has pointed to some of those, although some of them I think are not as strong as he realizes, like our school system in, rel in relation to the rest of the country and the world. Uh, we need to also identify the threats, what are things that are going to change that we need to get on top of, one of those clearly being what's going to happen at the training school. And we also need to look at our strengths and our weaknesses. We have many strengths, uh, but we also have many weaknesses. Some of that being in the youth area that Chad referred to uh, at the early onset of the work that he and Ed Gittins did together to, uh, to try to further uh, um, identify that. So strategic planning, you can get fooled by saying, well, I want to see the strategic plan. What's more important for our community is a process. Okay, keep the microphone, you're next. Um, first, for the next question, how do you plan to control town spending to keep our taxes from rising in the face of decreasing tax revenues and the potentially increased school budget next year. Okay, could you hear me? Yeah. Mr. Els. Sure. Well, I really appreciate that question because Bill has said a couple of things that quite honestly I can't understand. First of all, he's talked about decreasing spending. On the back table, you'll see a spreadsheet here. The cost that he can control, the selectman control, has gone up over 7% since he took office. Where have we seen savings? Well, most of it's actually been from Region 15. It's not because Region 15 is spending more, uh, spending less. It's because our proportion of the students has gone down. It's a demographic shift more related to the building in Middlebury. That saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars. In addition, last year, our Board of Finance recommended a refinancing of the debt that we took on 
for the properties we've been talking about, and that saved us another couple of hundred thousand dollars. So what we control has not been uh, kept to the low amounts that he's uh, left, uh, referred to or the savings. What do you do? Again, I would refer you to my position papers. I think it starts with better use of information technology. That drives improved processes. That's what I've learned in my, third, in my 23 years of corporate America, is that you look at your organization, you constantly try to improve it, streamline it, and you use information technology to effectively do done that. I, as well as many others on the Board of Finance, have been very frustrated with Bill's approach to information technology. Um, and, and I think what we need is somebody who looks to that and who has a, an eye towards innovation, an eye towards continuous improvement. And that's what I would do. Mr. Davis, you're next. Well, I don't know how Ed can say that I've increased spending 7%. Uh, when I came into office, the budget was 19,000, the town budget, not the school budget, was $19,479. And today, in this year's budget, it was it's eighteen thousand eight hundred eighty-four thousand dollars, and that is not a, a decrease of six hundred thousand dollars. That's a decrease of five hundred ninety-four thousand dollars. So I was a little, over a little bit in my calculations. Uh, that's a three point oh five percent decrease. We have to continue doing that. We have to control cost. You can't just keep spending money and expect the taxpayers to ante up the bill. There are ways that we can save money. We have been saving money. When a, uh, 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 one of our employees retires or leaves our employee, we see if we can't split that job into two functions or three functions and hire part-time employees to take up the, that job. That saves us the cost of the 40% benefit package uh, that we would pay a full-time employee. There are certain skilled positions that we cannot do that with, but a lot of times there are secretarial positions, etc., that can that, that can be done. We have to watch every single penny we spend, but we can't not spend money for important things. We have to make sure that our police department is well uh, trained and equipped, and that's the end of my time. Okay, thank you, sir. The next question, we might as well get right to it. It's that pathway is the 077, the heritage village that was raised. Would you, both of you, comment on what happened, how you feel about it, and so forth? Okay. Mr. Davis. I think it's called the sidewalk. The sidewalk. Heritage village sidewalk. Okay, the sidewalk. I understand the question. Uh, when, the, when the Heritage Village Safety Committee came before me over a year ago, and wanted to build this sidewalk down East Hill Road. Uh, I was skeptical. I looked at it, I listened to their concern. There's three to four condos that this would impact and give them a way to get down to the library safely. We looked at the territory. Uh, we uh, tried to plan out where this sidewalk would go. The easiest place for it to go would be over on golf course property. At the time, I said the Southbury cannot build a sidewalk on private property. We've since re-looked at the property, and we've uh, looked to use a low-sip grant to construct this uh, sidewalk on town property. It requires a significant amount of fill, and it's a significant amount of engineering to do that. But we, we are, have decided to go ahead with that project. It is an important project. Eventually, we would like to connect the library to Main Street North through uh, down uh, Poverty Road, but that will take time because there's private property involved, and we would have to either buy easements or et cetera from them. It's, not, it's more problematic than the uh, sidewalk down by East Hill. But we do see the benefit to that. We do see the benefit to having seniors get their exercise and, and, and ease of uh, access to the Main Street area through their pedestrian traffic. Okay, Mr. Edelson, your response. Well, this is an interesting one, because uh, Bill and I were, were at the same meetings, and I guess we walked away with very different impressions. I have here a letter from May 4th that describes what Heritage Village wanted to do, and it included a schematic that shows not the uh, sidewalk going through the golf course, but along East Hill Road, exactly what Tom Crow presented last week. 
So I need to know what happened between May 4th when our board, uh, I'm sorry, when our board of selectmen basically said we can't do this, and last week. Now I know uh, uh, two of uh, uh, Mr. Davis's representatives came to a safety committee meeting uh, at Heritage Village that took place, I believe, May 26th. And they said, once again, we can't afford to spend this kind of money on private property. But then again, I'm telling, showing you, and I'll be glad to share this with you, that wasn't their intention. Their intention then was to build on the easement, which is now what's been approved. Now, the other part of this is, that's not the only communication. There was a letter prior to that in 2010. There was a letter prior to that in 2009. And there was a letter prior to that in 2006 where people from Heritage Village said, we need a sidewalk on East Hill. That's not the kind of response that the town should have, uh, to let these things drag on and on. And that's why I brought this story up, because people from Heritage Village said to me, town hall doesn't listen. That's not the kind of town hall I would run. Okay, we're switching gears. It's your turn first. Can Southbury accomplish new growth and still maintain its rural feeling? Well, I think there is lots of potential to do that in a good way, and the most important one to me is the Southbury Training School. Now, keep in mind that the Southbury Training School used to be a much more vibrant economic area. Uh, when it was at full population, not only in terms of the number of residents there, but the 24-7 uh, staff that was required. We're down to something at a much lower level now of, of activity. So clearly, the area that I refer to as the Southbury Training Campus, that area could be better utilized. In fact, I would say it's underutilized today. I'm glad that Bill is finally trying, taking a look there. And I'm glad that Republicans are finally willing to have some conversation about the Southbury Training School after years and years of always saying, it's a state decision, we have no role to play. But the other part of that puzzle is the agricultural lands, the 900 acres that are uphill from the campus. And if those could get protected, by an agricultural easement, by a permanent agricultural easement, I think the town would be well along its way, well, I mean, statistically well along its way towards maintaining and preserving open space that would be very beneficial. And I am very committed, if I'm your first selectman, I've already started conversations, I've had conversations with uh, our governor for uh, actually years about the importance of doing this. Those of you who have seen the, uh, the YouTube video from his visit here uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was now, uh, he made very strong comments to show that he understands the importance of open space and he understands the importance of having a concerted plan for what we need to do as a state and as a town to think about the future of the Southbury Training School. And I would look forward to working with him on that. And with my time, I just want to repeat, on the back table, there is a spreadsheet with town data. And you can look at it yourself and decide where the numbers come from. Thank you, sir. Mr. Davis. When I think of economic growth in South Korea, I think of Main Street because that's where it's zoned. And we have made a concerted effort over the years to retain the business community in the zone for which it was designed so we didn't get uh, business sprawl. As I said, we have 400,000 square feet of buildable area left on Main Street South. You retain the rural character by putting the buildings back from the street creating a wide vista for Main Street, and having most of the parking behind the buildings. Those are two important planning principles that don't give the, uh, the, the, the look of clutter. When you talk about rural uh, community look, when you go down Main Street, you don't see any air conditioning units, air handling units on the top of buildings. They're all screened from view. That's part of our process, so that these buildings look clean and nice and not like factories uh, stuck out in the middle of nowhere. So I think that we retain the building area for commercial to Main Street, where it was designed to go, and that's how you retain the rural look of Southbury. Uh, the training school is right now zoned residential, should the uh, property come up for, for use, it would have to be rezoned, and those were, would be new uh, ideas that would have to be brought before the town and I can't see large commercial use over there. Okay, moving right along. Before building more retail space in Southbury, how would you propose we fill all the empty storefronts 
we already had in <coughs> Mr. Davis, your first. The first way we do it is by improving the economy. Uh, this is not a great financial uh, economy for companies to be expanding. We do have empty storefronts uh, on South, on Main Street South. The Economic Development Commission has on their website a listing of all these properties for potential uh, potential uh, businesses to look at, to see. There's pictures of these properties so they can actually see these before they come here to look. Southbury is a very, very good environmental for the business community. As I said before, the demographics were, are here. Uh, the companies know that, as with Kmart, it's one of their successful places. Uh, Stop and Shop, uh, McDonald's, even with our sign restrictions, we might have the only McDonald's in the country without a Golden Arches. But it works for Southbury, and, it, and it, it can continue to work. We have to have these companies come here and look at these properties and see our environmental, uh, and see our economic condition, and they will come here when when uh, the economy gets better, and that's the whole key. Okay, Mr. Edelson. Well, as Bill knows, we, we are not the ones who drive the economy, and uh, we don't have that kind of decision-making power in town hall. What we need to do is run town hall as efficiently as possible to show that we are professional, that we are willing to work with people, and that we know how to collaborate and, and create good ideas and execute them. That's why I found the corporate park so distressing. Because even if Bill is correct that somehow these guys could not take no for an answer, and he was unable to tell them, this is not the right town for you, and still gave them the stage, again, who's running the show? If it's the developer or is it our first selectman? But if other developers are looking at that audience and that reaction that happened last Thursday night, I'm afraid they're going to get a sense that this is a community that's not interested in new business. And that's not true. We're interested in the right business. And we have to show ourselves to be professional, know how to work with proprietary data, not divulge information that we're not ready to divulge uh, or not been permitted to divulge before it's time. Those are all the activities, of, of all of the signs of a professional government that businesses are looking for, that they know it's a level playing field, that some people don't get preference just because they lack it. The, okay. They don't get preference. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Edelman, the next question is yours to start. What can be done to improve public transportation in South Barry? Well, that is a difficult one because of the, uh, the way we are spread out. Uh, but again, I think um, there might be some potential, but I think if anybody is really expecting, uh, you know, the, the Manhattan uh, Transit Authority to be uh, relocated here in South Barry, uh, you're going to be hard pressed for that. But we have a number of, of uh, vehicles that are being used day in and day out uh, by various services, whether it's Pomparag Woods, Heritage Village, uh, East Hill, or I should say Watermark, as well as our own senior service. And I think there's some potential for better collaboration there. There's been an attitude, and I think it permeates this town, is each organization is sort of thinking about what's in my best interest. And, uh, and especially in these hard economic times, that's what usually happens. Everybody hunkers down kind of circles their wagons and says, well, what can I do for my group? And that's where you need real leadership that brings people together and shows them that actually by working together, you can uh, make it better for everybody at the same time. But we would need to look at that. Uh, again, it's always going to be a very tough problem, I think, because of the way we are spread out. Um, and I don't have any magic answers. I would say, and I think we've made some progress because of our regional uh, planning authority, known as uh, the Council of Governments, that we are starting to have transportation that helps people from Waterbury come to Southbury. And these are people who are working in Heritage Village, uh, uh, Watermark, and Pomparag Woods. And I think that's an important uh, first step in providing a more comprehensive approach to allowing people to travel without relying on, uh, on automobiles and yet trying to create the, uh, the commerce that we need and the, and, the, um, and the transportation to support that. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Transportation is a difficult problem. Uh, we just got a new, if you call it minibus, it's, it's a well-appointed uh, bus with a uh, hydraulic lift for the uh, handicap. Uh, we got that with uh, a grant money. Uh, I'm glad Ed mentioned COG, the Council of Governments. I'm vice chairman over there. 
they do have transportation grants that are available and we work very hard to share in those grants. Uh, I have been talking to over the years, over the year, uh, with Watermark and the Heart and uh, East Hill Woods. They run buses all over town for their own people. We run bus trips at the town of Southbury to Waterbury for doctor's appointments and even into New Haven and Danbury for doctor's appointments. The people call the day before, make an appointment, we pick them up at their door, take them to their appointment, pick them up and bring them home. It's almost like the livery service. It's a great system. It needs to be expanded and people need to know more about it. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, another question uh, for you, sir, from Ms. Davis. Many parents believe that there need to be programs to provide opportunities for high school students, such as internships, perhaps community service, community gardens, etc. Do you agree, and how would you make that happen? Opportunities for high school students. Opportunities for high school students for internships? Perhaps that's one of the suggestions to give a enrichment to the curriculum, provide more opportunities for high school students to... I guess that's the question. Well, I'm kind of at a loss here. <laughs> uh, we do provide, uh, of course, athletic things for them to do and, and high school sports and spectator sports. Internships would be offered by uh, private industry. We do have interns uh, that work in town hall. Every summer we have an intern that comes in and works in the town clerk's office, and we have one also in the tax department. We have, uh, we always employ lifeguards, uh, et cetera, camp counselors during the summer for our park and recs programs. We have lifeguards at the town pool. Um, we do have opportunities for these people to earn uh, some spending money over the summer. And I, I don't I think we do as much as we can do with our what we have. Fair enough, Mr. Edelson. I'd like to tell you about a little program I put together as a volunteer uh, because I saw that there was a need for this in the town. And when I was over at the Watershed Coalition and on the South Bay Business Association Board of Directors, I realized there were two things. One, the board of the South Bay Business Association gave out annual scholarships. But they didn't really press anything to be done to receive that scholarship. And I realized being involved with a nonprofit that we all had needs uh, that could utilize skilled, or not skilled, but uh, youth to help us out with our nonprofit work. And so what we put together is we went over to the high school, found out that they are dying for internship programs there. The children all need these, whether it's for their uh, particular activities or for their resumes. And then we went to the nonprofits and we said, can you put together programs? including the town. So we worked with Tom Crow over at Public Works because although we have a GIS system, a geographic information system, we don't know where all of the outlets are from all of the pipes that feed into our rivers. And if we could have students go out with handheld devices, we could record where every one of those uh, places are. And that's important because if we ever had a chemical spill or an oil spill and we knew where it was, we could figure out what catch basin might that go in and what pipe would that go into the river. And then you could respond that much quicker. And that's a good use of student power. But quite honestly, with where I was, I didn't have the resources to make that go forward, uh, make that whole program go forward. I think as first selectman, working with the Region 15, and again, the first person I met with after I uh, was announced my candidacy was Dr. Sippy, uh, superintendent because I firmly believe we need better collaboration between the town, town hall, town hall government, and Region 15. We're one community, we've got to always look for ways that we can work together. And you do that by meeting, con uh, having conversations, whether it's a monthly, I'm sorry, a quarterly meeting, uh, where we get together, obviously also at the first selectman of uh, Middlebury, and you build trust, you let these rumors that start out about uh, people talking about Region 15's inefficiencies, you nip those in the bud before they start happening. People bad-mouthing, and it goes both ways, folks. 
Region 15 people say things about the town. Town says things about Region 15. They're not useful. This is the kind of negative energy that lack of leadership allows to happen. And then we don't look for ways as a community that we can build upon the resources we have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Edelson. Now